All right, hi everyone. Sorry for being a bit late. I was confused as to when to actually start. Uh, but here I am, I'm Corbin from NetBSD, and I'm going to speak today about uh, package source and how to um, enable better security features uh, with this project. As a reminder, package source is a multi platform uh, software distribution. You would also define it, uh, if you like, as a build framework and more generally maybe as a package manager, was studied by Al, here sitting in the front row, very appropriately. <laughs> Hi. Um, and it's the default source of package uh, software on NetBSD, of course, but also on SmartOS, on Minix, if I am correct now. And generally it supports over 17,000 packages now, and supports uh, over 17 individual platforms, NetBSD being counting only as one. Um, another word about why I'm doing this right now, we are at war. Um, there is this uh, cyber war, as they call it, raging right now. Um, you may have heard the news even uh, this week, Wikileaks um, released another bunch of documents, um, not just a bunch, like a lot of stuff from the CIA. And I consider that as uh, developers, Especially when distributing software, we have a responsibility towards the users, and it is um, part of my focus to um, care about security here and try to help with the situation. Package Source as a project offers great opportunity for helping out with this in, in this context, since we can work on uh, so many packages at once, um, since we have here a build framework and provide packages as, uh, as source, as binaries, and so on. So, about me in particular, I define myself first as an earthling. Um, I happen to have the ambition to write my own operating system. Uh, I call this the D4Hours project, where really I gather all of the work that I do, which is uh, related to that in different aspects, from the desktop environment all the way down to Ellipse. Um, NetBSD for me is an excellent way to learn how to achieve this, and I base my current work on this platform. Most of my work on NetBSD actually happens offline, which is why I use Git most of the time, uh, since I do this basically when I'm traveling. And uh, as it happens, I started a new company about nine months ago in Berlin, where I live. Uh, so we are reachable there, if, if you like to have a look. So what about us today? Um, much like in the paper submitted, I will start with a rem reminder of the process in place because security starts with management, with people, with uh, handling uh, incidents. Then I will enumerate features which are readily available in package shows. I will try to briefly introduce them, explain why they are useful, um, mention the respective challenges associated and uh, what is currently happening for each and every one of them that I have gathered here. And moving on, I will mention a few perspectives, uh, what can be introduced uh, after uh, taking care of what's already been done, and uh, conclude with Q&A sessions, as, as you do. All right, so when it comes to managing security, you basically have two options. Uh, you can panic, or you can try to recover. Uh, for this, in NetBSD and package shows, we have two teams in charge. One is called the security team, and the other is the release engineering group. Um, an essential part of security management with this project is the vulnerability assessment database, so we'll explicitly mention it, and how um, it is reflected um, when using package source from source or when handling pa uh, binary packages. And I will also briefly mention uh, the stable releases, uh, how they are handled in, in package source, um, porting patches, and also um, the situation regarding long-term support. Alright, so the security team first is the, the team dedicated to handling security issues in package shows. It is uh, preferably contacted over email. There is also a mailing list uh, from um, NetBSD that can be used there. Uh, there is tech security for security purposes specifically, or of course, the package shows users or developer lists. Uh, there is a GPG key available to contact package shows security confidentially, if you like. And uh, the vulnerability database itself is also available through the CDN from NetBSD at this address. 
So more concretely now, um, the vulnerability database is actually assembled from a number of different sources. Um, for the most important uh, part, I believe the release notes from the stream packages are really important to keep track of security issues. When this is not enough, um, we also take into consideration security advisories from a number of vendors. As in Sequenia is, is one of the most uh, is, is one of the vendors we follow specifically. Uh, have to collect the information from the sources uh, by hand or automatically? So the question is um, how the information is collected um, from these sources. I believe there is a semi-automatic uh, process from Sequenia uh, in place. There is a bunch of scripts internally in NetBSD. I'm not completely familiar with this process, so someone can correct me if I'm wrong. We have York, yes? Uh, we are basically uh, creating RT tickets from uh, mailing list posts uh, and or uh, RSS feeds and then uh, processing those by hand. Alright, so York just said, I will repeat for the record, um, we are using RT internally to keep track of security tickets and tickets are automatically created from RSS feeds and mailing list posts on um, these different sources and then they are processed by hand. So it is indeed a semi-automatic process right now. Um, so part of the list is also um, errata's or advisories from governmental organizations. So we, we try to keep track of CVE numbers for every vulnerability uh, registered in the database. And the resulting file basically has one line per entry and it is cryptographically signed sorry, uh, using PGP. If you want to enable uh, tracking uh, security updates um, or rather uh, the list of vulnerabilities relevant to your system, um, you can choose to have this being done automatically uh, over Chrome in daily.conf if you're using NetBSD. This is the value you have to set to enable this. Um, you can also fetch this uh, list um, manually if, if you need, like if your computer is not running at night. The minus S option is for checking the signature. This can be important in some contexts. And if you want to trigger a manual audit of the packages installed, instead of having it uh, done um, also daily through the system uh, reminders, you can use the package admin command uh, with uh, package admin audit. So in practice, when you install a package from source, the vulnerabilities file is automatically checked and this is what happens if you try to install a package with known vulnerabilities, there will be an error telling you to define uh, this value in nk.conf or otherwise to ignore this entry in package install.conf. This is uh, what happens if you install a binary package. Very likely, uh, very similarly, um, you get an error. And uh, it mentions also which vulnerabilities are actually impacting this, this uh, software. So if you want to uh, enforce or get rid of this, you can use package install.conf, where the configuration value is going to be uh, check vulnerabilities. You can set it to always. Uh, but if, if this is uh, too uh, restrictive for you, you can also set it to interactive, in which case you will be prompted. The prompt message will look like this. And if you do not want to proceed with uh, vulnerable install of Wireshark, indeed, you can say no, and then cancel the installation or otherwise allow it as, as you like. So as uh, I just mentioned, we have Al, Rio, I believe, and uh, York here, um, part of the security uh, team. So we'd like to thank them here, take this occasion, um, uh, before moving on to the release engineering group, which isn't uh, a security team in itself, but it has uh, it is relevant for security since it processes the pull-up requests, so the backports to the stable releases. And this is how security fixes are requested and tracked. So there are a few addresses you can check. Um, to follow the current status of the, the tickets on valen.netbsd.org or otherwise you can also uh, get documentation on the process at the, at the following address. 
Uh, this team is also in charge of scheduling freeze periods, uh, periods uh, preceding a release, where it is usually forbidden to update um, root packages, uh, except if they have uh, security issues. It is otherwise allowed to allow to, to, to update leaf packages, and this is uh, what you should check as a developer before doing it. So this is how the tracker looks for um, pull-up requests. So this is from yesterday, I believe, where we have only two requests which are pending, and they both seem to be relevant to security. But yeah, I'm sure the security team is is uh, on the edge of this. Um, speaking of stable releases now, brief overview of the current status. So in package source, as you may know, we have quarterly releases. Uh, the last release is 2016Q4. Uh, it is therefore maintained for security. However, the release just before, Q3, is no longer maintained. And uh, if you want to work on the next release, you can work directly on head, which is going to be uh, 17Q1 when it's uh, time to release, therefore after the freeze process. There is therefore no LTS support from the upstream of package shows, so to speak. However, Joyant, the company um, behind uh, providing smart OS based systems for its clients, uh, proposes LTS branches, and they decided to go with uh, the last branch of every year, so the Q4. Uh, they can be obtained on GitHub, for instance, on the Joyant Mirror over there in the package source repository. However, the focus in, in their case is really on SmartOS. They don't necessarily care about NetBSD there. But of course, many security uh, fixes are the same on both platforms. So you can absolutely choose to follow these branches if you want to have long-term support with security updates. So again, uh, the release engineering team uh, is a bit smaller, but also has uh, Rio in common with the security team. Uh, so thanks guys again for, for doing this, taking care of, of, of this task. All right, um, now for the security mechanisms themselves, I will begin with uh, package signatures, which were briefly mentioned by York this morning actually. So support for this was indeed introduced uh, a long time ago, uh, 2001. I think it was one of the first projects to actually support that when it comes to software distributions. Um, signatures can be implemented uh, with two different ways, either using X509 certificates or with GPG. GPG. Signatures ensure authenticity and integrity. However, they do not magically fix vulnerabilities that might be present. However, it is still security relevant and even more uh, critical when installing binaries over HTTP or FTP, which is currently the default way. Uh, signatures are used in production by Joyant on SmartOS since 2014 Q4, so it's been a bit over two years now. And to achieve that, they've uh, introduced a patch using libpgp verify, libpgp verify, sorry, instead of gnupg. However, gnupg is still necessary to generate signed packages at the moment. Um, this causes a chicken and egg problem, uh, since gnupg is typically installed through package shows. It cannot really verify itself when, install, when being installed the first time. So you can either bootstrap package shows from source and then build gnupg separately the uh, other tools which are required for any signatures. Or hopefully soon it will be possible to use NetPGP instead. I've been working on a set of patches to achieve that. It's solving this problem in NetBSD since NetPGP is available in the base system. I wrote a command line wrapper which interprets commands as they would be expected by GNUPG and um, wraps them for NetPGP instead. For this to fully work, it still requires some patches. I've started to commit them into base, but there is a bit more work to, to be done. And there is still a security issue remaining with detach signatures, which is what is currently used inside packages. So this has to be fixed also to fully being able to validate signatures properly. So in practice, if you want to sign packages as a user when using package source to install software, 
Uh, first, you have to generate a key, obviously. We can use GPG for that. Uh, we can also use uh, NetPGP instead. Here, the command is relevant for NetPG. You should also enable um, signing packages in nk.conf. This is obviously when building from source. And optionally, you can also define a different way to invoke NetPG in packagingstore.conf. And if you have more than one private key available, you can also enforce one, uh, like here at deadbeef. But obviously, you should replace this with your own uh, user ID. Uh, you can also choose to use different key rings. Uh, then you can have a separate key ring for managing signatures. And if you have only one private key over there, it's going to be the one used automatically. Um, with this done, you can use package source as before, make, install, make package, and so on, and it will automatically sign uh, packages as you build them. When installing packages, obviously the signatures have to be verified, as we saw earlier. Um, in packageinstall.conf, you can uh, enforce the verification of uh, signatures when installing packages. You can force them to be always checked. Um, obviously, you need to import the key for the user installing the packages, which may not be the same user as the one actually creating the signed signatures. So typically, the root user has to import uh, the signature, the, 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 the key um, verifying signatures, which can be just a public part, obviously. Then you can use package source normally, and it will automatically check for signatures. So here I have an example with an internal key from the HPSD project. And you get a bit more output when installing a package to confirm that everything was fine. Really, this comes from GPG, so it could even be removed and look just like a regular um, package installation. So this was about package signatures, unless there are questions, which I could address now, uh, or at the end, as you wish. I can move on now to um, security measures mitigating vulnerabilities instead. So the first one I will mention is SSP for Stack Machine Protection. Uh, this mechanism helps finding bugs since it uh, causes the programs to crash instead of silently corrupting memory, which in turn can be uh, exploited by attackers to execute their own code. So the way this works, uh, basically the layout of the stack is altered by the compiler when compiling. Uh, the compiler also adds a marker, which is to the called a canary value. This has a slight performance penalty, but in practice, on modern machines, this shouldn't be really uh, a matter. And um, basically what happens is when a fault is detected, the program is uh, crashing using a board instead of uh, undefined behavior or potentially executing code from an attacker. So this is uh, currently supported in package source but only for NetBSD and GCC. Um, to enable it, you still have to set this value this in mk.conf, and it will automatically add a compilation flag uh, when compiling packages. So in the case of GCC, this should be minus F stack protector. There are different variants which uh, can be uh, set, but this is currently the default one, if I remember right. So in practice, this requires the packages to support C flags, which is unfortunately not always the case. Uh, some packages still do not support it directly, uh, but I'm also working on this, trying to uh, go one by one when I notice that uh, SSP is not properly applied. In practice, there are still some challenges associated with SSP. It's not a silver bullet. It only protects C, C++ programs and interpreters. Just this time, compilation is not protected uh, with this. I just mentioned more flags uh, can be supported to, pro to uh, um, apply different levels of security, uh, more paranoid and with, better, with higher performance impact. Or there is also a patch from, from Google, uh, which is not default in GCC, which adds the strong stack protector mechanism, which is more balanced. And uh, as I mentioned, right now we only support NetBSD and GCC, but this would also work on Linux. Probably also Clang has a similar mechanism which we could enable. Um, with this said, if you want to verify that SSP is properly applied on your resulting binaries, 
You can use NM. Basically, you look for the symbols inside the resulting binary, and there should be stack check fail or stack check guard. In the case of NetBSD and GCC, you will find that different operating systems use different symbols to actually implement that. Like OpenBSD has different uh, has different names for the same feature. Uh, this feature is, by the way, enabled by default in OpenBSD since 2003, but also Fedora and Ubuntu since 2006, and Dragonfly as well since 2013. So I think uh, it would be reasonable to make it the default for NetBSD. This can obviously be discussed, uh, but this is the duration I would like to, to recommend. Uh, your guess? It's much older than Dragonfly BSD. Oh, okay, York is correcting me, actually, it's been enabled for much longer in Dragonfly. I think I got this from Wikipedia, so maybe we can correct that after, after the talk. So in the same vein as SSP, there is Fortify, um, which automatically adds boundary checks uh, when calling uh, functions from the libc. This completely mitigates some buffer overflows, uh, the ones obviously involving these functions. It requires support explicitly from the libc, since this will change the way system headers are actually uh, included. In practice, it has a very negligible performance impact, since it will just uh, check the length of the buffers um, instead of blindly copying into them. And again, this will uh, provoke control crashes using the board instead of silently corrupting memory and allowing potential attackers to exploit your programs. This is also supported in package source, uh, just like SSP, you can uh, enforce it in mk.conf. This will, in practice, set a preprocessing flag. In the case of GCC, it's going to be underscore 45 source equals 2. There are different levels, but this is really the one you want. Um, however, this requires the package to support C flags, so this is the same challenge as with SSP. And I believe, additionally, it requires um, optimizations enabled in the case of GCC. So it should also have um, minus O2. Again, just in time compilation is not protected, since uh, this is currently applied at uh, compile time. Um, and we are currently only supporting NetBSD and GCC, but this can also be extended to more platforms and compilers. Just like SSP, you can verify uh, by yourself, also using symbols uh, that Fortify was actually being used when compiling the program. In the case of my Hello World example here, um, I used this printf, and um, this call will automatically be replaced by GCC with another variant, checking the buffer uh, when compiling. This is again specific to GCC on NetBSD, it can change depending on your platform. Um, and if you look at the broader landscape, it, this feature is enabled in Ubuntu Linux and Android by default. So we could also consider doing it uh, ourselves. This is pretty much ready uh, in, for NetBSD GCC in package source, and we can easily extend it to more platforms. Now moving on to PIE. Position independent executables. Again, this is a mechanism which is typically enabled uh, in while building software, so package source is ideal for this. It's a bit more complex than SSP and Fortify, since this involves uh, two phases compilation and linking. Uh, in practice, now SLR, um, so maybe to, to summarize, um, PAX SLR is a security feature which comes from the kernel, which will place your programs and random offsets in memory instead of using fixed addresses every time. This helps mitigate um, exploitation, since then attackers need another bug to know where the what, what is the current memory layout for this instance of for this process. And PIE helps uh, placing programs at random addresses since it not, this program is no longer required to be placed in, at fixed addresses. So um, this makes exploitation more difficult, as I just mentioned, um, but it is also not a silver bullet. It will just make things more complicated for attackers. In practice, this is supported already in package source, again for NetBSD and GCC. 
it's enabled with uh, make.conf with makepy equals yes, just like for the kernel. And in practice, it, this will set the compilation flag. Uh, in the case of GCC, this is uh, minus fpick. It's not always correct, since for executables, it should really be minus fpie for position independent executable. But in practice, this works this way. Um, and it also requires, it also involves the linking phase. So in practice, uh, the package also has to support um, VLT flags and not just C flags. But there are challenges here. Uh, it's a bit more complex than SSP and N45 also because the extra flags that need to be added are only required for executables and must not be included for libraries. So uh, for executables, you need to add WL minus PIE, but only for executables. So this is currently implemented using the shell wrappers in package source. Um, however, since 16Q4, I think, um, C wrappers is now the default for invoking GCC when building packages. So this no longer works right now by default. You have to uh, set make pi equals yes, obviously, but also disable C wrappers explicitly for this to work. Uh, this is probably just a minor patch. I can uh, sit down with Jörg to discuss that after this talk. Maybe we can solve this uh, rather quickly. This would be great. Um, there are, however, uh, advantages and not only challenges to uh, PIE in package source. Since the package is linked, um, will actually uh, fail to build if they were uh, properly compiled with um, uh, linked with minus pi, but not compiled with fpick, because pi will require the objects to be position independent, and this is not the case of the C flags are not applied. So this is in practice a great way to know which packages do not implement flags when they should. Uh, this was the case, for instance, for OCaml earlier, and uh, PCI utils, and a lot of, of others. And I could detect a lot of them uh, with this technique, simply by enabling uh, PIE, and then uh, checking for failures. So again, this feature finds also uh, silent bugs, so programs may crash even without being under attack. And this usually reveals uh, memory corruption, uh, which would be otherwise unnoticed. Um, the programs will crash in different ways here than SSP and, and um, PIE, no, SSP and 45, sorry, um, since they may try to execute. Um, no, I'm confused. Uh, however, when they crash, the good news is that if it is because of SLR or mProtect, uh, like wrong permissions when I'm mapping memory. Uh, it is also possible to explicitly disable um, these features for specific binaries directly from package source using PAX control. This is implemented in package source in make PAX MK and uh, uses these two values which expect file names or in practice a list of file names and then you can generate packages which will explicitly disable ASLR or mProtect for specific binaries. This used to be necessary for Firefox, but as of NetPSD current, uh, it's no longer the case. In Snowbird, it's still the case, so I will try to have a look at this myself, or if you beat me to it, even better. Um, it still needs a protect disable. Yeah, uh, as you all just mentioned, Snowbird still needs and protect. Uh, however, I believe Firefox is fixed by now. If not, I can uh, import one fix I have from HPSD into NetPSD and package source. Now, if you want to check if your binaries were correctly compiled using PIE, you can use simply file, because this will generate shell objects instead of executables, which uh, will otherwise run just fine, uh, just like executables. However, the elf header will change. So you can easily see that uh, PIE was applied when compiling your, your binaries. Um, and therefore, be, be sure that um, ASLR can be applied to the full for this program. Now for another feature already supported in, in package source, um, 
it, there is this uh, specific feature for health programs called RELRO, which can be combined with BIND now to have full uh, effect. I think it's been introduced by OpenBSD a few years ago, and then um, adopted by GCC, upstream. This makes exploitation harder again by reducing the attack surface with uh, relocations. Uh, some exploits were abusing uh, relocation tables to jump to known offsets. This countermeasure um, makes sure relocations are applied when starting a program, then the corresponding page is mapped read-only and it's no longer possible to override these offsets for attackers. So obviously this benefits from immediate binding with bind now, uh, then the relocations are effectively um, updated when starting the program. There is a performance penalty for uh, big programs, obviously, so if you start open office, it may take a few seconds longer, for instance. And in this case, in package source, this involves only the linking phase, since this is essentially implemented by the linker. It's currently supported in uh, NetBSD, I mean, for NetBSD and GCC. It is enabled using this configuration variable in mk.conf again, and in practice, this will set uh, different additional uh, flags through LD flags. So again, this requires the package to support LD flags. And Relo is enabled using the first part. By now, is enabled using the second part. Right now, if you set Relo equals yes, it will automatically add these two flags in package source. What could be done, again, is maybe to add a bit more granularity to this behavior, allowing by now to be set or not set. It can also be adapted to more platforms, since many more actually support this. And in practice, we have the same issue as before. Uh, LD flags needs to be supported in the target package. Thankfully, there is also a way uh, to check if a package was properly built using Railroad. In this case, you have to use uh, opstump because this will affect the program header in the elf information for binaries. It will actually add one more section called relro, which you can uh, you can then check for its, for its presence. And if you want to check by now, you need to look at the dynamic section, which will add this value. Again, this is specific to NetBSD and GCC. I expect it to be uh, very similar in other platforms, but it, it can change, uh, obviously depending on the dynamic loader and other potential differences on your platform if it's not NetBSD and GCC. In the HBSD project, I have written a small package which can be used to check a number of the mechanisms that I uh, introduced so far. So basically, I wrote a very simple program called Hardening, which is linked to a simple library, which purpose is just to check that it was compiled correctly. So as you can see in the output here, um, the library checks if it was built with fpick correctly, then the executable checks if it was built with fpick, which is not uh, the best scenario, but enough for full XLR. Then you can also check if it was built with Fortify, and I added another check for a map to correctly fail uh, the write not execute, which I think is correctly implemented now in current, but wasn't uh, in NetBC 7. Um, unless you have questions about the different mechanisms I introduced, we can also get back to them later. I would like to mention now um, which other ways can be used to further improve security in, in package shows. Uh, we have essentially three ways that I have uh, identified for, for this uh, presentation. The first is reproducible builds. It's not a security feature in itself, but it allows um, issues to be tracked uh, among different users, because then if somebody finds a package vulnerable, for instance, with a backdoor, uh, then it's possible to check if the backdoor was introduced at the source level when building the package or later on by an attacker. So the definition of reproducible builds is um, a set of development practices that create a verifiable path from human readable source code to the binary code used by computers. In practice, you want to account for every bit inside the resulting binaries and be sure you can reproduce the exact same binary uh, on a different computer. So for that, you need to keep track 
of the build environment. Um, this can involve uh, environment variables, versions of the compiler used, uh, the platform, the kernel versions. In practice, it involves also timestamps. Um, there are lots of issues which need to be um, addressed uh, in oftentimes to actually build software reproducibly because this is uh, really a recent focus uh, in, in development mechanisms. Um, however, I think it's a key aspect for um, the years to come. And in practice, it's already been implemented in FreeBSD for the ports. The initial patch actually just sets the timestamp to um, the one from the distinct profile. Yeah, it's but it's not entirely implemented. The first steps are in. The second steps will happen in the next weeks. All right, so Batiste just said it's not entirely implemented. Um, one part is already in, another part is not completely uh, integrated. And I also noticed that specific patches are needed for some packages, like for Perl. Um, but I believe your numbers are pretty good already. With just this initial patch, you had 65% coverage. Uh, and now... With the pending patch, because this is not activated without the pending patch. All right, so, so this is not... 65% with uh, the pending patch. So you are at 85% now? Yes. Yeah. All right. This is already like progress, a lot of progress. Um, so in practice, uh, the timestamps can be set uh, using the source date epoch specification, which has been uh, defined by the reproducible builds project. And it, uh, the reproducible builds also involve some flags uh, for GCC. Uh, in, for instance, um, when you build a package, it will often leak a local path inside the resulting binary, for instance, for debugging information. And this can be hidden away using uh, these two sets of flags. Uh, there's probably more aspects which will be covered in GCC by the reproducible builds project in the years to come, but this is already something you can look at if you want to ensure your binaries are reproducible across uh, file system locations when building. Uh, so this is it for reproducible builds so far. Um, moving on, I would like to mention code flow integrity. Uh, this prevents exploits from redirecting the ex execution flow of programs. I think this is uh, protection against rob chains, return-oriented programming. Um, again, this will trigger control crashes instead of uh, running into undefined behavior. And uh, again, package source can be a great testbed for this feature. Um, in practice, it is available in Clang. I don't know if GCC supports this feature, but if you use Clang, you can use these two flags here, minus FLTO and then um, F sanitize, which can be set with different levels. The one that I mentioned here, just CFI will enable uh, all of the ones available by default, as far as I know, to which it is possible to add also visibility hidden. I do not remember the details right now, but this is documented very well on this link, this page above. And additional debugging information can also be uh, obtained. Open crashes, this is another compilation flag, which can be set to get to know where the program crashed. And uh, as of today, uh, it is documented as suitable for release builds. So the performance impact was largely optimized and it can be considered as negligible according to the documentation. So this can also be something which can be enabled by default when using Clang. Then GCC supports something called Address Sanitizer. It is a memory error detector. Uh, it instruments memory access instructions. It can detect uh, bugs such as user to free or out of bounds access. It involves the C flags again uh, using um, F sanitize equal to address. Again, more mechanisms uh, are supported, can be individually enabled. I'm aware that some NetBSD developers are already using this uh, individually to track errors and allow uh, better fuzzing, uh, since this will trigger um, warnings or crashes in earlier than, uh, when, um, than just correcting memory. This will be detected. 
and uh, therefore it can also be added into package shows, um, maybe not by default, but as a feature to assist and help uh, finding bugs in different ways, not only involving fuzzing. Um, so with all of this said, uh, to, to conclude, package shows is a great project for testing security features and applying mechanisms uh, 17,000 packages at a time. Some possibilities are already implemented, can be enabled. Uh, we can discuss which ones could be turned on by default even. Uh, a lot more can still be done though, and um, we, we can uh, mention it either during the Q&A session now or maybe after this talk. I would like to thank, uh, to conclude, the organizers for inviting me, having me here, you for listening patiently to my words, uh, the Package Soul project for being uh, so excellent after 20 years, Joyant for also helping out with the project, in particular with the LTS support. Uh, you can obviously contact me at uh, this address, uh, NetBSD, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to uh, and so we show where again. Yeah. Yes, you talked about uh, stacks matching protection. Yeah. SSP. I I want to know the performance impact by enabling the SSP at the time. So the question is about the performance impact of SSP. Um, actually, uh, maybe your knows. Uh, typically between two and five percent. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's between 2 and 5 percent. The number I had was 3 percent, so it's within this uh, margin. And actually, there are different levels. Uh, as I mentioned, there is minus S stack protector, which will enable um, SSP just when the compiler considers it is uh, beneficial. Or you can also set um, stack, uh, stack protector all, which will then enable it for every function call, making it therefore slower. In practice, on my system, I'm using uh, Stack Protector All, and um, I don't really notice significant slowdown, also because I uh, don't have a comparison base. I don't have two laptops uh, next to each other with identical configuration just to check uh, which one is faster. But yeah, that's, uh, in, in practice, I don't really notice anything wrong. And I'm even using LibreOffice here, so this should be a good benchmark. Any other questions? Yeah, Jörg? A uh, couple of remarks. Yeah. Uh, ASLR, you wrote uh, that to defeat ASLR you need a uh, memory leak. Yeah. Sadly, that's not true. Uh, there's a lot of recent research on uh, how to use uh, cache timing, for example, yes. to completely defeat LS ASLR. Uh, Pi Independently of that, has I will repeat. Uh, I can Sorry. repeat maybe at this, at this stage. So you just mentioned uh, there is research ongoing with very good results on how to defeat ASLR without requiring a, a pointers uh, to be leaked uh, using cache validation, for instance. Uh, if I understood the paper correctly, I think it requires the attacker to be able to execute code, for instance, in an interpreted environment like JavaScript. So this completely defeats ASLR for web browsers, for instance. But I don't think it defeats it uh, for uh, maybe PDF readers or uh, image viewers, at least as long as you don't have macros or bytecode being interpreted. Uh, it's good enough if you can run uh, code on the same machine, and that's a bit scary. For example, if you, if you consider cloud deployments. Yeah, that's absolutely correct too. I was only having in mind the case of running individual laptops or but shared environments are vulnerable to this, obviously, yes. Uh, one interesting part you mentioned about Pi is uh, if you have Pi binaries, they don't need uh, copy relocations. And that's very nice from an uh, ABI uh, stability point of view, because uh, uh, the sizes of uh, global variables are no longer leak from a shared library into the main binary. So uh, that's a good reason for wanting Pi independently of uh, ASLR. All right, that's good news too. Um, for ASIN, uh, the address sanitizer, and its uh, big cousin, the memory sanitizer, uh, the biggest problem with those is they require a lot of memory. Be um, 
the address sanitizer is basically keeping a bitmap uh, with a flag for uh, every word or every uh, character. So uh, you want to have a 64-bit uh, operating system for that and it's still going to require lots and lots of memory. So uh, the memory sanitizer is a, a very good alternative to Valgrind as a debugging tool. So very useful to know. All right, thank you. And one last remark. Um, uh, you've mentioned uh, Pax Emprotect. So uh, we are not very happy with Emprotect uh, at the moment because uh, it essentially makes it very difficult to do just-in-time compilation and a number of other things. We are currently dis discussing patches for uh, uh, providing operation to take one memory mapping and uh, create a second mapping of the same physical uh, pages and that can have different protection flags and this can also be used to get uh, most of the benefits of Velvo without having to disable lazy uh, bindings. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the microphone is coming. Yeah. You know, Fortify uh, looks like a better solution rather than SSP. And but from your presentation, the Forty is available in DCC only, not the crank. Um, if I remember right, this involves the system headers for the most part, uh, but also specific attributes to the compiler. Uh, and I'm not aware of supporting Clang. Um, in, in package source, it exists specifically uh, supported only in GCC, but maybe you will say that it, it is supported in Clang too? So basically you need the built-in object size uh, intrinsic and that's supported by both Clang and GCC. So the necessary attributes are supported by both Clang and GCC, so there is no reason to just limit it to GCC in package source. Let me correct one thing. Oh, you yeah. mentioned Liu Onodera. He and his uh, username is not Liu, but oh. Liu, Liu, Liu. R Y O O N. All right, sorry. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of Japanese uh, NetWizzy uh, developer uh, that their first name is Liu. More or more. Okay, I will correct the slides right away. Thank you very much. <laughs>